This morning I took some time <clears throat> to talk to you a little bit about the fact that they have found a new galaxy. And in the middle of the new galaxy there is a black hole. And the black hole is bottomless. And it is 30 times larger than what that anyone anticipated that it should be at this point in its development. And I uh, related to my wife when she was reading to me about it yesterday that I really believe that that's the description of it matches the description of the bottomless pit, the lake of fire. Because it, um, the Bible said that hell has increased herself daily. It's getting bigger and bigger. Everything that it gets close to, it sucks in. It's got tremendous heat being generated out of it. Now, how they measure that, I don't know. But um, I do want to tell you this, that hell's a real place. And uh, just as true as heaven's a real place, hell's a real place. And uh, this all-consuming thing that's moving through the universe, eventually it'll, it'll get to the earth, and when it does... The Bible has a scripture for it. In fact, the scripture came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But not one jot nor tittle of his law shall fail to come to pass. You mark it down. It's going to come to an end someday. Now, now I, I went on to say this this morning, and I told this to the folks out in the internet world that I do not believe that any of the things that I'm talking about in this present service this evening has to do with the end of the world. God has a calendar, and he's laid the calendar down very succinctly and very clearly throughout the word of God. And that is that there is on the not-too-distant future the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the end of the world. That's the taking of the church out of the world. Then following the Lord taking the church out of the world, there is a thing called the tribulation period. It is seven years of the wrath of God, according to Revelation 6, the last verse, that will be poured out upon the earth. From all that we can tell from the prophetic schematics that are in the Word of God, the assignment of seven years, a week with the Lord, a day with the Lord is a year in prophecy, etc. Then that, that tribulation period looks like it's going to last seven years. Then that tribulation period is going to hold from its beginning to its end what will probably historically someday be called the Third World War. And it will conclude with the campaign at Armageddon. The campaign of Armageddon concludes with the Lord setting his foot upon the Mount of Olives and creating the valley of Armageddon that will be 200 miles long. And in that valley... We don't know for sure how that, how that the next war is going to be fought. But we know how the last battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. It's going to be fought with swords and sticks and staves and horses. Because it looks like that the beginning of this third world war is going to be a terrible nuclear exchange where the Bible gives a very definite description and said that those that are a part of it, that their eyes melt in the socket and that their flesh falls off the bone while that they are still walking. We would not know the impact of a nuclear exchange had we not been the persons that created Nagasaki and Hiroshima in the country of Japan. It was a horrific happening, but it did bring the Second World War to an end. And once that happened, General Dwight David Eisenhower said that almost anybody now would be able to build a nuclear device if they could just get the right components for it. Because once that Pandora's box was open, it was out there to do what it was going to do with the weaponry in mankind. But um, there's going to be a terrible, terrible battle. And all of that's going to come to pass. And then after the battle of Armageddon, after Armageddon is over, the Lord returns to earth and he sets up a kingdom and he rules the world from Jerusalem. That's what the Bible says. Somebody said to me one time, Brother Harper, do you believe everything the Bible says? I said, I do. The fellow looked at me and he said, prove to me that the Bible's right. 
I said, the book of Proverbs says, the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. And I reached out and took him by the nose. He said, I'm a believer. And so, but the word of the Lord is absolute and it's true. And so we have that to look forward to. But we have a thousand years of peace. That's when the devil's bound for a thousand years. There'll be no tempter then. All of you ladies, I know some of you color your hair. I noticed that. Uh, because one service you'll be a little lighter, the next service you'll be a little darker. So something's, something's going on. I, I just happen to know that. But you won't have to worry about it after the millennial reign begins or the thousand years of peace because the Bible said an infant will die at a hundred years and still be called an infant. Death will be subsided. We're going to go back to some living like we did in the land in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine what a mess Eve made for all of us? She's the reason you've got wrinkles. She's the reason your hair's white. She's the reason that your hair falls out because of what happened when she handed Adam that apple or whatever she handed him. Maybe it was something else. I don't know. But I want you to know something. That dummy eat it too. And so here we are stuck with our age and our lumbago and our arthritis and our rheumatiz and everything else that comes along. But in the millennial reign, that's not going to be there. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. But at the end of the millennial reign, Satan is turned loose for a short season he makes war on the camp of the saints and that's all of the people that are born during that time that have come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody is going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ through the millennial reign. There'll always be some hardheads. If you don't believe in the Lord, well, you're not in a minority because there's more people going to hell than there is going to heaven. I got bad news for you though. If you're going to hell, you're not going to be with your friends because nobody's going to know you down there because that place called hell is total darkness and it's where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not and there is no rest for the wicked. So that's all, that's all a part of that. and that's, that's a scenario that we're going through. So what, I, what I'm going to talk about tonight is not a sign of the end of the world, but it is a sign of some cataclysmic things that are lining up in the earth. And it's one more signal why we are coming closer to what is referred to as the rapture of the church or rapture or the caught up or the caught away, the coming of the Lord to take the church out of the world. We're just another day closer to that. And what I'm here tonight and the reason that the churches even exist is to get people ready for people to go be with the Lord because that's what this whole thing's always been about. The Bible said that the Lord declared the end from the beginning. A lot of people think Jesus come to Calvary was an afterthought. No, it was planned. The Bible said he was crucified from before the foundation of the world. Having said that, he saw a throne. At the end of time, he saw one sitting on the throne. He saw the mighty God of eternity inside the body that is called Jesus Christ. And he saw 10,000 times 10,000 around that throne worshiping him and then God set out to make his dream come true. And you and I are a part of the work of God tonight, gathering up more people to be a part of that fantastic congregation around the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping him. Now, because that he did what he did, there are people in the world that believe good. All I got to do is wait and be a part of it. Nope, you got to make a choice. The choice you got to make is who this day I'm going to serve. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Well, what you do to come to God is you repent of you. you first of all, you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Can anybody say Jesus is God? That's right. In fact, we got a song we like to sing. It's all in him. Praise God. He's God. And when you talk about Jesus being God, then you've got to believe that that Jesus died for our sins. Because if you believe not, the Bible says, if you don't believe that I am he, then you'll perish in your sins. It is a prerequisite to salvation to believe that Jesus Christ is the mighty God. And when you believe that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, then you're going to want to repent of your sins. 
Your sins are all the things that you do that transgress the law and the works of God. You always get this person that asks the question, well, how do I know what's right or wrong? It's kind of like a story I heard one time. There was a man that bought a parrot that was a terrible parrot, had a terrible mouth on him. And sometimes he used profanity. And so eventually the guy thought it would be a joke to give it to the preacher. So he gave the parrot to the preacher, and the parrot, of course, had a terrible mouth on him. But the preacher worked with him and worked with him and broke him for cussing, but he never broke his bad spirit. There was a lady in town that was very, very wealthy that came to his church, and the parrot was in the pastor's office, and the lady walked in, and when she walked in, the parrot said, What? You're ugly. <laughs> the pastor turned around to that parrot, and he said, I'll have you for supper. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't you ever say that to that woman again. The next time she came in the office, the parrot said, Oh, you know. <laughs> so when people ask the question about what's right and what's wrong, I'm going to tell you something. They might play dumb, but they know. They know. You knew. Before you ever came to God, you knew. You don't need a handbook on what's right and wrong. God put a conscience in you. The Bible said if your conscience don't condemn you, you're in pretty good shape. But I promise you, your conscience will get the message through to you. And because you know what sin is, you repent of those sins and you ask God to forgive you. And after you ask God to forgive you of your sins, you do what this lovely young man did tonight when he stood up there in that cold water and let me give a Bible study and talk a little bit. After I went down to apologize to him, all he said, it's all right, it's all right. I'll tell you what, coming to God will give you a sweet spirit. That's right. And so you'll be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's what it's for. Now let me just help you a little bit. Now this is really not what I plan to preach on tonight. And I, I promise not to be lengthy. I'm, I'm, as Brother Kitchen would say, I'm taking all of this off of the end of my sermon. I'm not going to preach longer just because I'm telling you this. Praise God. But let me explain something to you. When you repent of your sins, that's when God forgives you. When God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's when he goes into his record and he blots it out. Well, then what happens when you're baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is this word remit? It comes from an old a word that's used a lot in French courts. But it's, a, it's, it's basis is in the Latin language. And uh, the word remit, here's, here's the easiest way to explain it to you. If a gentleman goes down to the bank, Davy, and he pays off your house, and the man writes the man a receipt for it and says, he's paid off David Lee Kitchen's house. When they get the money, they go in the back room, and on their record back there, they blot out your debt to that house. But there's one more thing that's got to happen. Even though the debt's been forgiven and paid, and even though the bank has blotted out the record, that bank filed what's called a lien at the courthouse. And in order for that record to be taken off of your report forever, they've got to get an attorney to take a piece of paper that's called a release of lien and take it down to the courthouse and file it and that takes it off of your record. So what happened tonight with this young man? God forgave him. The Holy Ghost blotted out the record of his transgression of sins, Acts 3 and 19. But he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the lien against his soul was released in the records of heaven. Now, I want you to understand something, friend. You ought to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's God's plan. In fact, does everybody understand English in here? You understand English? We've even got a girl from Romania over here. She understands English. All right? 
But she was tickled to death the other night when somebody got her in touch with another Romanian Christian and they, had to have, they got to have a conversation on the telephone for a while. But let me, let, me, let me tell you something about plain English. Somebody said, everybody's got their own interpretation. Come on, I want y'all to help me interpret this. You ready for this? What does the word, words, every one of you mean? Are you sure? Doesn't have a private interpretation. All right, then I'm going to quote you a scripture. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've got a question. Does that need to be translated? Then that's what it means. Then everybody needs to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you will speak with other tongues. Now, let me tell you something. Speaking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost. But when you get the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. Somebody could teach you to say a language you don't understand. But when you get the Holy Ghost, you'll start speaking a language you don't understand because God said it was going to happen. And that's the beauty of it all. When you, everybody that receives the Holy Ghost does speak in other tongues. Now that's a beautiful thing to understand and to know. Well, so much. All right, I took 17 minutes off of my sermon. Now I just got to preach an hour. Now I'll tell you how that got started tonight. That got started tonight because there wasn't anybody to sing while the choir was getting seated. So um, that was your song for the choir to get reassembled with. Praise God. You love the Lord? Amen. Let's stand together. Say, I'm awful glad to have with us tonight Rick Jones and Kevin. This is the grandson of Atheline Albert. We're awful glad that you're here in the house of God. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you for being here. You've come to the church with the... Let me read one text of scripture and then I'll go to work and talk to you tonight. The Bible says in the book of Joel... The second chapter in the 31st verse. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And everybody say, the moon turned to blood. You may be seated. I introduced this to you tonight by first of all telling you that more than one time in the Bible is this phrase, the moon being turned to blood, used. But in the three times that it is referenced, it is always referenced in the book of Acts, in the book of Matthew, here in the book of Joel. Actually, in the book of, in the book of Matthew, it actually says when the sun is darkened that the moon will be darkened and will not give her light. It is a reference to the same happening, and that is the eclipse that will take place tonight at about 10 o'clock. Now, when we talk about this eclipse taking place, somebody said, well, what's the significance of it? Back through history, this turning of the blood, and what it is is that you have, this, you have a full moon, and when you have a full moon on this particular full moon, the moon be, is eclipsed, because the earth moves between the sun and the moon. And the result of it is that it takes on a reddish glow. Now, what has happened in the history of it is that, is that there have been times in history when this has taken place. And as it has taken place, what, what has happened is that it comes in, in groups of four. That means that there were four blood moons within the stretch of just a few months of each other. In less than a two-year period, there were four blood moons. What's interesting to note that is that they go back historically and they begin to look at some things. How many of you remember the story of Jesus Christ being crucified? And do you remember at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it says particularly at that time that the sun refused to shine. Do you remember that as well? That was because there was an eclipse of the sun on the day that Jesus Christ was crucified. Well, what also is very interesting about that is that just days before, a few months before, and a few months after that, 
there had also been what is referred to by people as a blood moon. That happened the year that Jesus Christ was crucified. The next time that there would be these four blood moons that would come together would be in the years of 162 A.D. and 163 A.D. And that happened to be the time that a great plague settled in across the world and it caused a lot of people to die from terrible, a terrible plague that just spread through people in a terrible situation. And then it would happen again in 795 and 796 A.D. And they happened to happen. And this is, this is the thing about it that's rather, rather interesting is when they happen on Jewish feast days, they are referred to expressly as the blood moon. And so it happened in 795 and 796 A.D. And this was the time that there was the great war that took place when that there was a defeat of Islam by Charlemagne. And Charlemagne came into his known power as a ruler of the world. And it was directly dealing with the Islamic community that was such an enemy of Israel. Not much has changed. One of the things that I'll tell you that this is just 200 years after that the ideas of Mohammed and Islam came into being. And already they were so great, such a persecution to the Jewish community. And then there would be another one that would happen. And there would be a time when that the Muslims would go to Rome and they would sack the Vatican and sack the city of Rome. And that would be in the years of 842 and 843 A.D. The next time you would see it would just be 20 years later. And there would be a great Arabian war. And again, there would be a defeat of Islam. And it would be in 860 to 861 A.D. Now, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again in the years of 1493 and 1494. And at this time was the time of the Spanish Inquisition. It's the reason that there is a... It's the reason that the Jewish people, they were run out of the land of Spain. And... Um, being run out of the land of Spain, you have a place over there now that's called Portugal. They were run out. The others left. It's when that you hear great names that uh, uh, the Rothschild family was one of the folks that left the land of, of Spain during the great Spanish Inquisition. It's when there was great persecution against Jewish families. They, of course, went to France. And today, when you mention Rothschild, you're mentioning one of the finance powers of the world. But also they had, a, they had a servant, so legend tells, and that servant's name was the Roquefeld. And whenever that he, and during the Spanish Inquisition, so I'm told by Brother Jonathan Hershen, uh, who is since deceased, uh, but he had historical record that he shared with us. And that was that one of, the, one of his servants by the name of the Roquefeld that worked for the Rothschild household, he gave his life saving the Rothschild's oldest daughter. Well, the Rothschilds, when they got to, to France, they moved all of that family from servant status up to family status. And one day, one of them came to the land of America, and when they came through the, the ports of entry, the man by the name of Juan Bar David La Roquefeld, the name got changed. And you can assume what that name is for, and it has something to do with oil. But nevertheless, that was a part of the results of the Spanish Inquisition. The next time that there is a blood moon of great significance to Israel is the years of 19 and 49 and 1950, when all of a sudden there's a great war that breaks out as a result of the fact that in 1948 in May, there was a nation that was created in a day. The next time that there's a blood moon of significance to Israel will be in 1967. I remember that. I was alive in 1949 and 50, but I don't remember all that happened. I do remember being in a tent meeting in 1956 in Nitro, West Virginia, and Brother Morris Stringer was giving Bible studies about the end time, and he talked about how that they fought the battle at Jerusalem and how that the Jewish people took over Jerusalem and how that the Arabs had to leave Jerusalem in 1948 and 49 and 50. He told about that, but I remember 1967. I was a 17-year-old boy. And in June of 1967, with two blood moons preceding it and two blood moons after it, I remember that when Israel 
in, in six days, called the Six Day War, marched across Israel. They defeated the entire Syrian army and the entire Egyptian army and the entire Jordanian army in a miraculous fashion. Uh, we had a man here at the church, two men that I love very, very much, uh, that were really into it. And because of their interest in it, they included Brother Douglas, and they also in, in, in included uh, uh, some other gentlemen, but Brother, uh, Brother Triplett and Brother Melvin Ross were very, very interested in the Six-Day War. And they had every news clipping that you could find about it. And having those news clipping, there were stories in there in the Six-Day War how that when fighter jets would buzz Israeli soldiers, they would pull from their side 45 caliber handguns, shoot into the air, and all of a sudden, Syrian and Egyptian fighter planes would burst into air. There was one story about a Syrian column coming across a field and how that when the tanks were coming across the field, one of the boys had a 50 caliber machine gun and he's all that he's got to defend himself in the Golden Heights against the Syrian army that's coming in, in tanks at him. And he fires that and the tracer rounds catches the field on fire and the fire burns across the field and the soldiers in those Syrian Russian built tanks jump out and they take run for their life and they were running because of a 50 caliber tracer bullet had set the field on fire. There's a story told about uh, when they were approaching the western wall how that there was a, a group of, of Egyptian and Palestinian soldiers that were raising an awful ruckus and they had several Israeli soldiers pinned down. I can tell you this not just only from the clipping but I heard it told by one of the men that was in the group in Israel. He said we were pinned down and he said the men were shooting at us and said all of a sudden they jumped up and threw their hands up in the air and ran the other direction and said we looked around us and said behind us there stood a man about eight foot tall with a flowing white garment holding a big sword in his hand. He said, God manifested the presence of an angel over top of us. And that story was in some of those news clippings that Brother Ross had. What are you telling us, Brother Harper? I'm telling you that God knows what he's doing. And that's the day that they took back the western wall and took back the temple area and when that it actually started the end time according to the book of Daniel, the 7th and 8th chapter. That happened in 1968. Well, the next time that it would, it's happening is right now. Everybody say right now. So we've got what looks to be like historically a real happening that directly affects Israel. How could it be that this is affecting Israel? Well, let me, let me just talk to you about what we do know at this point about some of the things that are going to happen in the sequence of events that is a part of the end time. The first thing I'm going to tell you is this, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. Now, when's he coming? Well, I personally have an opinion that probably it's about two years from now. But as things are molding into their place to happen, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ might be coming back in a couple of years. Somebody says to me now, and somebody out there in the audience just now said, way down deep inside, why, Brother Harper, why would you say that? Nobody knows the day or the hour. Well, I understand that. Now, but the scripture that you quoted doesn't have anything to do with the rapture of the church. The scripture that you quoted has to do with the end of the world. I'll just rehearse it for you quickly. You can check me out with your Bibles and read. And that is in Matthew, the 24th chapter. At the end of the 23rd chapter, Jesus is sitting on the hill in Gethsemane and he's looking over at the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And he makes this statement that this beautiful city that you see as you go into the 24th chapter of Matthew, he said, not one stone's going to be left upon another. It's all going to be torn down. And it startled the disciples. And they looked at the Lord and they said, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, Jesus takes quite a detailed time and he tells them about the armies gathering around Jerusalem and they hope that it doesn't happen in winter so that your flight won't be in winter. But he was going to come and uh, he, he said that not one stone would be left upon another. 
That was what was going to happen. And he told them what to look forward to. And in 70 A.D., sure enough, exactly the way Jesus told it. That's the way it happened. And they came in and disassembled the temple and took all of the stones down to the foundation. The next question they had asked is what's going to be the sign of your coming? Well, Jesus goes through all of it. And the sign, and everybody hear me right now. Everybody say the return of Jesus Christ. Say that. The return of Jesus Christ. The Bible said, the re, what is the sign of your returning? The return of Jesus Christ is when he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. And he fulfills the scripture that says, This same Jesus that you see go away is coming again in like manner. And that's, that's to fulfill Zechariah the 14th chapter. That's his return. But And when he makes his return... He comes with angels. He comes with great triumph. He comes with great power. Revelation 19 says he comes riding on a white horse. He's got written on his thigh the word of the Lord. And then he's got written on his vesture, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's when he comes to fight the battle at Armageddon. All right? And so in Matthew, the 24th chapter, all of the signs that are given there about the return of the Lord are not talking about taking the church out of the world. It's talking about him physically coming back and setting his feet on the top of the Mount of Olives. Now, here's what you have to understand. This is all written to Jerusalem and to Israel. What is written there, those signs. But so be it. So be it. Other you could ask me questions privately if you have some. I'm going to move on. I just don't want to take over an hour and 17 minutes tonight. But I'm, I'm jerking on you a little bit there. But what, I, but what you've got to understand is that after he explained about where the carcass is, there will the eagle be gathered. And what he was talking about was where the, all of the dead bodies are at the Valley of Armageddon. The Bible said that the eagles came and would eat on the flesh of captains and kings and, and horses and etc. That's what happens at, at Armageddon. Well, he said, well, wherever that is, that's, that's where the carcass will be gathered. And then he just stops. And Jesus says, now I've got something to tell you. And he makes the announcement. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot nor tittle of my law shall fail to come to pass. And, of course, if you question that, I could have them put it on the screen. It's Matthew 24, down around verse 33, 34, 35, 36 in there. But, but we, won't, we won't go there. I just want to tell you, and you can look it up for yourself. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot nor tittle of my law shall fail to come to pass. And then he says to them, and of that day, the next verse, and of that day, Knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. What day? The day heaven and earth passes away. So here we are now. Oh, you cannot believe all the stuff that's going on in the earth today. And it's incredible what we're seeing take place in and around us and around the world. But what I want you to know is this, that he said before that that battle of Armageddon takes place, he says there, the sun will be darkened and the moon will refuse to shine. And so we are on our way to Armageddon. That's just what I want you to know. We're on our way to Armageddon. That's that great and faithful day of the Lord. That Here it's called the terrible day of the Lord. It is the day that is spoken about in the book of First and Second Thessalonians. That that day shall not come until the Antichrist is revealed. The day of Armageddon, not the taking of the church out of the world. But I believe the church will be leaving in a couple of years. I really do believe that. But what I want to tell you is this. Is once the church is taken out of the world, there are some things in the scripture that the Bible says is going to happen. And that is once the church is taken out of the world, there's going to be the revealing of an antichrist. And that revealing of the Antichrist is the, is the guy that's against everything Jesus stands for. That's why he's called Antichrist. He's a false prophet. He's the devil himself. 
He's a miracle worker. In fact, the Bible says he gets his power from the devil. I've heard people say, oh, the current president's the Antichrist. No, don't, don't even go there. Don't even go there. His people's from Africa. He don't match. The Bible lets us know this. The Antichrist is going to be a Jew. Not only is he going to be a Jew, but he's going to come from the city of Rome. Now, the guy that just got on a plane in Philadelphia might know a little more about it. And then there's going to be a false prophet. So the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and finally the world gets what they've been looking for. That's a trinity. Never been a trinity before, but there's going to be one in the end time. There's going to be the false prophet, there's going to be the devil, and there's going to be the, the Antichrist himself. And they'll finally have their trinity. Trinity's not even mentioned in the Bible. All we know about the Bible is that, that there's three that bear record and these three are one. It's always one. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one. I made all the earth and created it by myself. Another God, I know not any. That's all through the word of God. They just won. All there's ever been is one. Now, what I want to tell you is this, though, is that once the Antichrist is revealed, he makes a covenant with Israel. The covenant with Israel is so that they can go into their worship. Now, if you would, put this scripture on the screen for me, and I must hurry. Put this scripture on the screen. That's Acts, the 15th chapter, and verse number 13. I want to read it slow because I want you to get, get the essence of it. The reason it's, in fact, let me tell you what. Hang on to that. Put your marker on it. I want you to come back to it. Put on the screen for me first. Put Daniel 9 and 27 on the screen. This is talking about an agreement that the Antichrist makes in prophecy. Daniel points this out. It says that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. And for the overspreading the abomination he shall make it desolate even until the uh, consummation. And that determination shall be poured out upon the desolate. Now what that is, it's a part of the Antichrist agreement. There's some before this and some after this in, the, in Daniel 9 that we'd have to go into for a total explanation. But you just take my word for it that the Antichrist makes an agreement with Israel to allow them for seven years, it's a seven-year treaty, that allows them to start sacrificing, to start doing offerings, and doing their prayers in the grounds of the temple because that's the only place that they'll do the sacrifice and their oblations. All right? Now, now put Acts, the 15th chapter, up, and I'll show you what the prophets had to say about that when that particular event starts. Everybody say, he's going to tell us when it's going to start. Are you ready for this? It says in Acts 15, it says, After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Verse 14, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Next verse. To this agree all the words of the prophets as it is written. Three Old Testament prophets have cited that. After this, after what? What did he just say was going to happen? He's going to do what? He's going to take the people out of the Gentiles with his name. <laughs> for his name's sake. Now it says, after I do that, that's talking about the rapture. I'm going to prove to you it is. After I take these people out for my name, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and he even tells you where he's going to build it. I will build again the ruins thereof and will set it up. The only sacred ground for the tabernacle of David on the face of the earth is where the temple has been torn down in Jerusalem. Now, they're going to set it up there. The only way they can set that up is with the agreement of the Antichrist to allow them to do it with this world rule situation that we're watching development right, right now all around us. Seeing this, where that five nations plus one are able to determine the treaty that directly affects the land of Israel. We see all that going on. So they're going to need the agreement of the Antichrist to allow them to start their sacrifices and oblations and to build it. 
But the Bible that you saw me read to you said that wasn't going to happen until after the church is taken. Now let me help you a little bit more. Put the screen, put the words of Acts 15 back up on the screen. Next verse. That the residue, come on moms, what do you make the kid wash out of the bathtub? That's what's left. The residue. And the Bible says here that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon my, whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things. This is the doings of the Lord. The Lord's going to take the people out of the earth for, the, for his name's sake. And then the world is going to come looking for what? They're going to come seeking for God and they're going to come seeking for the Gentiles upon his, whose name been called. Going to come looking for the church. Doesn't say they're going to find them because they're gone. And when you use the word residue, it's the people that's left behind after the rapture. All right. So I said all that to say this, as Brother Rigney used to say. I said that to say this. Is that after the church is gone, then according to the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter, the first great appearance you see is the Antichrist. And he cannot be revealed as long as what hinders him keeps him from being revealed. And that's the Holy Ghost that's living in you, Davy. The Holy Ghost in you is what keeping the Antichrist. The Holy Ghost is living in you, Greg, is what keeping the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is living in you back there. I want you to know something. That's what's keeping the devil from making his stand as the Antichrist right now. Because he that's in you is greater than him that's in the world. That's what's holding him back. But when the Lord takes the church out, then the Antichrist is free to go to work and do what he wants to. Now here's what happens. The Antichrist comes with all of his famous words and all these peace treaties. The next thing that happened, there's a seal open. And when this seal is open, there's a rider on a red horse. Antichrist on a white horse. He attempts to look like Christ, but he's not Christ. Then there is the Seal of the red seal is broken and the red horse comes out. And when he comes out, he comes out because he's going to bring great war on the earth. Well, the Bible lets us know where that war is going to come from. It's in the book of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Are you ready for this? Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Put the, put the first verse up on the screen for Ezekiel 38 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, and the land of Magog, and the chief prince of Meshach, and to Bull, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, and the chief priest of Meshach, and to Bull. And I will turn thee back, and will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine armies, horses and horsemen, and all thy clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. And then he includes Persia and Ethiopia and Libya with them all, and with shields and helmets. And he includes Gomer, and he includes the house of Togomar, and the north quarter, and all the bands and many people. Be thou prepared, and prepare thyself Thou and all thy company that they are assembled together and thou be a guard. Well, it goes on and on and on. But what it's talking about is they're all going to attempt to attack Israel. This was just published. I knew it was coming, but it was published at 5.09 p.m. today in the Wall Street Journal. And it is, it's written by a man by the name of Matt Bradley. I'm just going to summarize it real quick. And that is that they have formalized years of military collaboration between four nations. The four nations that they have formed the collaboration with is Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Russia. The Bible says that Gog and Magog is the land of Russia. The city of Meshech in old maps is Moscow. The city of Tobol that's on old maps on new maps is Tobolsk. It's the land of Russia. And here's the collaboration being put together. Wait, we're not finished. He said, we have also informed the leaders of Turkey, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia 
that they too will join us in this effort. And they claim it's to fight ISIS. Let me tell you what it is though. It is the formation of the Islamic coalition that is spelled out that I just read to you here in the 38th chapter of the book of Revelation. Let me give it to you real plain. How many of you know where all of the refugees, the Islamic refugees are going? They're going into Europe. What part of Europe? Going into Germany, across Hungary. And that's, that's where they're fleeing to. All right, there's already a great settlement of Islamic people in the lands of Germany and Eastern Europe. That is on the old maps what they called Gomer. Togomar is Turkey. <laughs> Persia is everything from the Euphrates River, excuse me, everything from the Nile River to the border of India. That's the old Persian Empire. That's the countries that's involved there. Ethiopia is down in Africa. The land of Sudan is one of the greatest Muslim strongholds you've got. And then you have got, of course, Libya. What are you seeing? You're seeing everything put together. Now, Brother Harper, what are you trying to tell us? I'm telling you that it looks like that this blood moon may be the signal effect that in this particular weeks and decades that we're now joined into is going to be the signal of another great effort to shove Israel into the sea. I got bad news for this army, this Bible. Everybody say, this Bible. This Bible says that five out of every six of those one billion and six hundred million soldiers are going to die on the fields in their attempt to take Israel. And the Bible said it's going to take seven months to bury the dead. But there's going to be enough implements of war left over that they can fuel their homes and fires for the next seven years. Isn't that an interesting number? That is the distance of time that other prophets have assigned to the tribulation period. And what you are looking at is the fulfillment of things coming. Well, let's go back to Revelation real quick. I want you to take another look at something that I, I think that is important to read and to tell you. And that is that in this happening, there are some things of subsequent sequence that takes care of itself. And then it says, and if you'll put on the screen Revelation 6, we'll read this and we'll bring it to a close tonight. I'll read all of it. Six and one. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. What do we see happening? And I saw a horse, a white horse, and he that sat on it had a bow, had power, had a crown. He was a ruler. And he went forth to conquer and to conquer, but he didn't have any arrows. Number three, it says, and when he had opened the second seal, he said, come and see. And verse 4 says that I beheld and there went out another that was red and power was given to him that sat upon to take peace from the earth. And they that should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword. Verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard them say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the beast say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Hold that right there for a second. In the midst of this attack on Israel, the scripture in Ezekiel said they're going to go up and over to the land of unwalled cities, of a mixed multitude, and gotten cattle. That lady in New York Harbor has been welcoming all types of people from all over the world to America for a long time. And we are the land of gotten cattle. Other people have heard me say this. It's worth saying again. The native cattle to North America is the buffalo, is the moose, is the caribou, is the deer, and the elk. That's the native cattle. All you see with from the longhorn to that pretty little white-faced Hereford out there all of those cattle, the Brahma, they all came from Europe, Africa, India. None of them are native to America. We're the land of gotten cattle. And here's the tragic news. is the only way that Russia has got a shot at Israel. The only way. Is they're going to have to stop this big force over here called America. And I'm telling you, there will be a nuclear exchange. There will be 
a nuclear exchange. Because the Bible says over there in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says that their flesh belts off their bones and their eyes belt out of their heads. That's right, and a great light and great heat. And God's going to fight back with fire and brimstone. But Israel's going to survive. Somebody said, why are you happy about that? Well, I'm happy for two reasons. First of all, that's God's promised people. The second reason I'm happy is because the church is going to already left here when all that starts. And these blood moons, what happens when America is gone? America's been the breadbasket of the world. And when the breadbasket of the world is gone, then you're going to see great inflation. It'll take a whole, a penny was a day's wage in the Bible times. It'll take a whole day's wage to buy a loaf of bread. You think things are high now? <laughs> They've just started. But then it said, the next horse came. And then he opened the fourth seal and I heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And behold, a pale horse came, and he that sat upon him was called Death and Hell. And power was given over him for the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with beast of the earth. One fourth of the earth's population gone in a matter of about seven months. Friends, you can take these times that we're living in lightly if you want to, but I'm going to recommend you seek the Lord. I want to be ready for the rapture of the church. I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I was in 1961. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and I was in 1961. And I want to make sure that I'm still full in 2015, 16, and 17, I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord. I want my children to get ready. I don't want them to look like the world. I don't want them to act like the world. I don't want them to be like the world. I want them to be like Jesus. And I'd like to be like Jesus. I want to make heaven my home. Praise God. I'm just wondering, are there any volunteers in here tonight to go to hell? I don't see one hand. Brother Poff, that means everybody really wants to go live with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Then we ought to do something about it. Praise God. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 I want everybody to say to the person beside them, I want you to go to heaven with me. Don't you go to heaven with me. That's right. That's as personal as we can make it. Now, since I want you to go to heaven with me, I want you to go down to the front and let's all go down there and pray together. Praise God. That's right. Everybody come. Everybody. You're trying to trap us, preacher. I wish I could trap you. If I could trap you, I could guarantee I'd keep you out of hell. Praise God. Come on, all over the building. Let's make our way down here and talk to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's right.